morning, everyone. Wow, there's a lot of people in, in the room. Of course, when I prepared for this presentation, I needed to figure out you know, what would the audience be like. And I've worked with actuaries, um, a lot of actuaries over the times. So I've been mainly focusing on insurance the last 20 years. But I did go on Google to figure out you know, what's the typical actuary. And the first page on Google, if you go to Google and you punch in actuary, there's this Q&A thing around what an actuary actually is. And one of the questions is, what is, a, what is an actuary like? And the answer is, it's a seriously smart person. And the, even the, and the seriously was in bold. <laughs> so, so of course, that made me even more nervous to talk to all of you today. Not only is it a big crowd, but, but of course, also an extremely intelligent, intelligent crowd. Uh, so bear with me. I'm going to try to take you through this in um, 45 minutes, uh, so only have a little bit of time. So I'm going to keep it quite, quite high level, but hopefully you can also make it an, an, engaging, an, engaging, uh, an engaging discussion. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the, what we see are the major trends uh, out there in the market and um, what, how the insurance companies are most likely to respond uh, to those trends. And, and finally, and maybe most importantly, what, what do we see the actuaries of the future actually look like? Before we get into the, the, the details and the content, let's try this uh, Slido thing. How many, how many of you have been able to go into Slido? Just as a show of hands. Oh, a lot of you. I told you you were smart. You, know, you, get, you get this. OK. Let's just see if it works uh, with a, with a, with a non-content question. OK. For those of you who don't know who Springboks are, uh, it's the rugby team. We actually had two slides of this. We had one which says Japan, one that said Springboks. But of course, uh, uh, luckily, we made it to Springboks. Uh, let's see how this goes. The count, OK. 72%, that, that's, uh, that's quite good. Of course, we have 26% uh, say, saying no. Of course, when you ask actuaries this question, of course, we expect it to be more, more pessimistic than the average, uh, average citizen. And uh, I guess that's why premiums are so high in South Africa, because um, <laughs> you're conservative. OK. Uh, enough with the jokes. Let's go into the, the content. Um, two very simple uh, things we will go into. It's uh, what we call the winds of change. These are the trends that we see are affecting insurance companies and actuaries all over the globe, not only in South Africa, but also in the US, Europe, Asia, everywhere. There are five major trends that we see, which I'll take you through in a second. And then secondly, we see that there are different positionings that the insurance companies are taking. None of those positions are better than the other. They just require different success factors to win. But in all of them, the, the role of US actuaries are going to be quite, quite, uh, quite uh, different. So let's start with the, the first question. <clears throat> If you look, if you project 10 years from now, do you think you're going to work as an actuary 10 years from now? I see this is a fairly young crowd, uh, so not many people are going to retire, but of course you can do something else. But do you think you're going to work as an actuary? 69%. Still there are 3% saying, who are the Springboks? Oh no, this is a, this is a different question, so let's see. <laughs> okay, we're counting, we're counting, we're counting. 300, 400. Ah, okay. Only 59% of you. Hmm, okay. I actually expected this to be a higher. It's interesting that this room of, uh, of actuaries say that only, only barely half of you is actually going to work as an actuary. But, uh, but if you look at the numbers from the people who do this as a living, you see the numbers here in terms of what are the projected number of actuaries you're going to see in the next, uh, next 10 years. As you can see in the US and UK, from a, from a higher base, of course, given the size of their countries, they do expect the actuary profession to, to grow. Uh, being actuaries, of course, you know what the compounded annual growth rate, you already, you already have that in your mind, right? So US and UK expected to grow a little bit below 2% for the next uh, 10 years, around maybe GDP growth. South Africa is expected to increase quite dramatically the number of actuaries, of course, we did ask you know, the actuarial association about these numbers. So of course, this is um, a little bit biased, perhaps. But you see a huge number, a huge increase, you know, just below 6% annual growth 
in new actuaries. So this is the residual between how many actuaries are educated versus how many people are expected to leave uh, the workforce. So there's a huge increase in actuaries. And, and we actually are, um, we belong to the, the people who think that this is a fairly accurate picture. Because uh, don't believe the hype, because when you read, uh, when you read in papers and read in media, you, you would think that you know, artificial intelligence, ma machine learning, and uh, you know, uh, the big data analytics is going to substitute the need for actuaries, and only a few actuaries are going to be left to do the extremely difficult stuff. But we don't believe that. You know, there's, there's a lot of room for, for actuaries also in the future. You are going to be doing different stuff. You are, you are going to access different types of data you are going to be working in a different way than you do today, much more uh, outside the silo, much more multidisciplinary, but there is going to be a significant room for actuaries just doing a little bit different things uh, than today. So let's move into the first part, the, the winds of change. And these are five what we call mega trends uh, that we see across, uh, across the world. And these are the five. Uh, on the left-hand side, as you would expect, you see huge change in uh, how consumers, uh, both retail consumers, businesses, and also brokers, how, and intermediaries, how they actually uh, prefer things to be done. And what's interesting now is that uh, no longer do you need to compare yourself towards other insurance companies or towards other banks, as an example. The benchmark is definitely not in that environment. The benchmark is being formed by experiences that both retail and business customers are getting from other uh, players than insurance companies uh, and banks. Actually, insurance companies are one of the worst in terms of really understanding customer needs, really understanding what kind of journey they go through, really understanding what their pain points are and addressing them in a simple way. So there's a huge, huge um, challenge for insurance companies on the, on the left-hand side, on consumer preferences. The second one is around the digital and big data. There's going to be so much data available to you guys, available for the insurance industry. And where we see the biggest movement is no longer trying to analyze existing data that exists within the company. It's actually accessing third-party data from, from partners, uh, but also from uh, what's publicly available in the market. And consumers are more willing to give the data away now than they were before. So, so it's, you're going to have access to much more data, and of course, you're going to be able to analyze that much more sophisticated given the advent of technology. The third one that's changing is uh, the product. So we see total risk pool is probably going to go down in the future in total, and there are some risk classes that are going to go severely down. For example, retail B2C motor insurance we ex in the developed market, in the developing market, or in let's call it in the U.S. and Europe, we expect some markets to be reduced as much as 50% on B2C plain vanilla motor insurance. Just an example. But there are other risk pools that are definitely going to increase. Cyber risk, of course, may be the most prominent example. So there's going to be huge change also in terms of the products and the risk pool development going forward. And of course, we all read every day about Brexit. We all read about you know U.S.-China trade war. We see a new um, economic uh, uh, geopolitical landscape uh, forming a much more volatile environment, which of course is good news also for actuaries. We need actuaries to actually make sense of the macroeconomics that we see. Uh, and of course the regulatory environment is just getting more complex and uh, very much focused on uh, consumer protection. But we also see regulation coming in a, in a big way. So all of these five are, are, um, are going to impact the insurance industry in a, in a major, major, major way. In addition to this, of course, we see that given these uh, trends, we also see new entrants coming in. Uh, so if, when we talk to insurance companies in South Africa, uh, we spend half the time talking about what local South African insurance companies are doing, but we spend at least as much time discussing what are telecoms you know, likely to do, what is Google likely to do, what is, what is you know, pick and pay likely to do. So anyone that has a huge customer base that knows how to handle customer data is going to be a competitor in the insurance space uh, going forward. So these are some of the trends that we see out there. I'm going to concentrate a little bit on the three first of them, uh, and then we're going to go on to what does it have to say for uh, insurance companies. I think the first one, consumer preferences, is, is, is quite, quite a simple one. Particularly in the retail space, uh, individual space, of course, you would see that the benchmark for experience are the guys that you see behind me. It's going to, they want simple, they want to be simple, it want to be quick, instant access, access all the time. There's a huge change happening based on the consumer preferences. 
If, and if you look at the work that we are doing to, uh, together with insurance companies, most of it these days is around customer journeys. Uh, so we look at you know, how, what, this, what the journey people go through, really understanding what the pain points are and really figuring out how to address them, having these guys behind me as the inspiration and not other insurance uh, companies. So that's on the consumer side. On the big data analytics side, there are so many things happening. I think nine, we listed nine of them uh, in the back, and they, and they impact insurance companies, of course, in, in different ways. So on the, on the social, local, everyone is, uh, is mobile. You have GPS, you have location services. Of course, you introduce much more pay-as-you-go services in insurance type. You have the cloud, which you get access to much more computing power now than before. Uh, Internet of Things, now you can be connected also to the insured uh, products, but also the customers. Uh, big data is, is, is fairly obvious. Um, intelligent operations is quite interesting, the way you can now use machine learning to maybe operate a call center in a different way. So all those things that you see behind me are, are shaping the, the, the future of insurance in a very, very fundamental way. To give you a practical example, I'm just going to show you one, one small thing, not very sophisticated, but that had a huge impact, just using the advent of data and analytics. This was a client that we had in, in Asia, in Asia. Uh, and uh, the problem they had is around cross-selling. And most of you who is working in insurance companies, you, know, you understand that uh, it's difficult that for, to go to clients that have one product and try to sell them other products. Uh, so this was the starting point of the, of the customer. Um, they were extremely frustrated because they didn't have a uh, high enough cross-sale rate. So you have the customer, they like you as a company, but still you have problems selling other products to them. Uh, and what we did was a very, very simple algorithm, predictive algorithm, to figure out who is most likely to, to be good potentials to, to cross-sell. Because the current situation was that they were basically doing a, the same thing to everyone and didn't do a differentiated approach. And we're doing a very, very simple analysis, which I bet 99% in this room, probably except me, could easily do in your, in your, in, in the, when you're sleeping. We, we came up with this kind of uh, analysis. And each of the bars, so we cut, we cut the different segments, customer segments, in 80 different unique uh, segments. And then we looked at, on the, on the, if you see the, on the, the probability of them actually uh, being good candidates to cross-sell. So the more left you are and the, more, the higher your bar is, the more likely you are to buy another product if you already have a product uh, and, the, and the other way around. And we also looked at the, 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 the probabilities. So what you see here are, and, and, the green, and the green line is, is the accumulated uh, part of the customer base. So you can see, uh, if you look at around you know, segment number 30, everyone to the left there are, are higher than average uh, probability of, of being good cross-selling candidates. At the same time, the, the, the customer, the client of ours, spent as much time on the right-hand side chasing people who are not likely to buy at all. So by very easily shifting the attention to the, the, the client segments, the customer segments, to the left of this curve, which only constitutes, I don't know, 10% of the total customer base, you were able to have much more uh, successful uh, hit rates than you did before. And if you look at the results of this from the client perspective, it was dramatic results. Maybe most interestingly, 45% growth in, uh, in GVP, GWP in just, uh, just eight months. But something as simple, as, simple um, as that. In South Africa, we have done the, the same thing many times. And um, one of the more interesting areas is the area around churn. Uh, because most, most companies are so concerned about how can we attract new customers, how can we acquire new customers. At the same time, they're losing customers at a spectacular rate. So most often it's not about you know, how many people can you attract, it's more about how can we keep the customer that you already have. And by, by doing simple algorithms in terms of predicting who's most likely to churn as one, and secondly, what, do you, what is the next best action towards those have, have tremendous, uh, tremendous uh, results also in, in, this, uh, in this market. So digital analytics is going to totally change uh, the game uh, in insurance going forward. The third one was around uh, the different risk pools and different products that we see. Uh, and this is uh, an important one um, where we see dramatic changes in, in risk pools, uh, risk pools uh, going forward. Just to give you a sense of how we model some of these, uh, these effects, the, together with the, the World Economic Forum, they asked us the question, what will mobility look like uh, going forward? And of course, the answer to that question is important in many, many 
domains, you know, sustainability, climate change, smart city, but also from an insurance perspective, it's important to understand how will people move uh, going forward. And of course, the huge uh, uh, trend towards urbanization. This, this year, of course, is the first year where there are more people in the world living in cities than in rural areas. It has, that, that inflection point has been reached. Uh, so we looked particularly at mobility in cities, in large cities, and how will that uh, develop. And we created four different uh, scenarios on, on, on doing so. This is the, the summary, basically. So the difference, there's four scenarios we see for moving around in a city. On the, on the left-hand side is the thesis that says, um, yeah, this whole autonomous car thing is going to come, of course. We see it, self-driving car, but it's going, only going to be for the exclusive elite that can afford it. So it's only going to be for the BMWs and the Mercedes of the world, not the big masses. In the city, people are still going to move around more or less like they do today, but a few people are going to have access to autonomous cars. They're rich people. And as you can see on the left-hand side, there are fairly limited benefits uh, of that scenario. Uh, the, the, the vehicle park is going to be more or less the same. Number of accidents are going to be more or less uh, the same. Severity is going to go down, but frequency is going to be stay more or less the, the same. And as you go along, of course, autonomous vehicles uh, rule the streets. Uh, this is where you still will have a car. You will still own a car. It is going to be autonomous, much fewer accidents uh, than before. Not dramatically less cars, because you still need, going to need the car. But everyone in this room is going to have, have a car. The third one we see is the self-driving taxi revolution. This is where we see that people are still going to have cars, uh, but there are going to be taxis that are going to be driving around that are going to be totally autonomous. So, but you will still go to A to B uh, in, in a car. As you can see, dramatic impact on the, the, the number of cars you need and the number of, um, of accidents, both frequency and severity that you see on accidents. And on the right-hand side, of course, this is where you have, uh, not only do you have taxis uh, that are autonomous, but you also have sharing. Uh, and if you ask the young population today, and we were astonished by the result, you know, are you going to own a car in the future? Almost no young people today says equivalently yes to that question. You know, if you ask a young person, they're happy to share, they're happy not to have a car, they want to have it when, when, when they need it, but they don't want to have a car in the garage anymore. So this is going to fundamentally um, uh, um, put the current risk pool in motor insurance under pressure. Of course, there are new risk pools that are going to pop up because these taxis and these autonomous cars, they, they also need to be insured. Uh, so we're going to see a shift away from classic B2C motor insurance to more fleet management, more fleet type, uh, type and B2B, B2B insurance more than B2C. But totally we expect the total risk pool within motor insurance to be reduced by around 50% the next uh, five to eight years. And this is going to come much, much quicker than we think and then maybe you think. Uh, when, because we also work with a large um, car manufacturers and, and the speed of which autonomous cars are coming along is much quicker than anyone can predict. Uh, now, when I do this presentation, of course, much more depth uh, with insurance companies in South Africa, they say, ah, but uh, we can understand that, you know, in, in Switzerland or, you know, in Norway, but, you know, our robots don't even work, so how can we have autonomous cars uh, <laughs> driving, <laughs> driving in the city? And because of history, you know, we have settlements far away from cities. This is not going to, yeah, we can, this is not South Africa, this is not going to work here. But, but we fundamentally believe we're going to see that those issues are going to be overcome and we're going to see the influx of autonomous cars, self-driving cars, um, uh, also in, in South Africa, with huge positive consequences for the environment and for, pe for people in, as such but interesting consequences for people like you. Okay, so those are just some of the trends. And again, let me apologize for just rushing through it. I understand I'm rushing through it. We can spend the whole two days you know, just talking about one of these trends. But at least these are some of the things that we're seeing happening elsewhere. So now, the, if you believe this, the question is, if you are, if you are the CEO of an insurance company, what, what do you actually do about it? Um, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, now. And not only are we going to talk about that, we're also going to talk about it, you know, how do we see the actuary of the future in this environment. So huge changes sweeping the landscape. Insurance companies uh, have to act. And we think there are two important questions. Many, there are probably a thousand important questions, but two really important questions in terms of figuring out where to play and how to compete. The first question you have to ask yourself, are we just going to sell insurance? <laughs> You know, typically, traditionally, insurance companies, the com basis of, of, of underwriting, understanding, and pricing, and risk management, 
and have been very good at that, um, basically based on the, on the intelligence of you people uh, in the room today. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, it's not obvious anymore that that's the, that's the only competition you can play. Uh, and more and more insurance companies are venturing into what we call adjacencies. So if you do health insurance, you know, why don't you also go into the provision of services? Let's buy a, let's buy a hospital, let's buy after hospital care, as an example, if you're into home, you know, let's buy uh, real estate brokers, let's also you know, go into more other areas, and also new frontier initiatives, doing something totally different than uh, you, do, you do today. So that's one important question. Are you going to be a sustainable company if you only do what you do today? But there is, a, there is a caveat to this question. Many companies we talk to, they jump too quickly into chasing the next new thing out there. And when we do analysis on what growth uh, strategies that are most valuable, if you have 100 rand or 100 billion rand or 100 million dollars and you want to invest that in growth, empirically we know that you should spend between 60 and 70 percent of that money investing in your core rather wasting it on chasing the next new thing. Uh, and when we talk to customers today, what we see is that a lot of people want to do this huge ideation sessions. We have this great idea. We're going to create you know, the mother of all ecosystem within this thing, and we're going to own everything. And, uh, but you really look at it. Uh, you have to ask the questions, are we as an insurance company best positioned to actually play in that space? And very often, the answer to that question uh, is no. Uh, so, one question, so one question is, are we only going to do this, or are we going to do something totally different? Uh, the second question is around uh, uh, customer interface. This is a very important question, has dramatic consequences also for actuaries. You know, on the one hand side, owning the customer and owning the customer's data, maybe most importantly, sounds like a very romantic and very rational idea. The thing is that that competition is extremely, extremely difficult to, to win. Uh, so many players now are, are vying for the... For the uh, the, owning the, the customers, and insurance is still seen as a grudge buy, and it's not the natural place where you go to have warm and fuzzy feelings about the company. Uh, so it's still difficult to actually see insurance companies going all the, all the way out. On, on the other hand, if you, if you think about, you no, know, let's just be a very good manufacturer of, of services, um, and, and then we can distribute it to whoever wants to do it, even white label it, and we don't even care about having, having our brand out there. Of course, the, the positives of that is going to be very focused. You can be extremely good at underwriting. You can price risk extremely good. But the problem is, of course, that uh, you could easily be intermediated, and you can be exchanged from the next guy who's also investing in hiring people like yourself. Uh, so, so these are the two of the big, uh, big uh, questions you have to think about. So on the one axis, it's around, um, are you just selling uh, insurance? And if you go down on this, the further down you go on the axis, the more monolithic you are. So for example, I'm only gonna do motor insurance, but I'm gonna do it damn good. Or on the upper right hand side, you're saying, uh, no, there's uh, this an ecosystem play. Uh, we're also gonna pursue adjacency. We're also gonna pursue new frontier stuff that we don't even think about today. So that, that's uh, one question. And these are the typical questions that we're gonna, take you through. On the, on the y-axis, it's more about the, the customer interface, and the questions are around, are we going to be able to actually own the customer on the right-hand side, or do we need to be a producer and um, be very good at what we do, very good at pressing the risk, but not being very aggressive in actually having a distribution network and being able to, to keep our customers and be the natural home for, for customers. Now, you know, uh, we wouldn't be BCG if we, don't, we didn't love two by two matrices. So as you can see, this is um, evolving into a two by two uh, matrix that looks uh, looks like uh, this. Um, and uh, and, this, and these, are not, these are not trivial questions to answer for an insurance company because, you know, going to the going to the bottom left, you know, being very good at what you do, sticking to your knitting, um, you know, it sounds interesting, but you need to have huge scale for that model to be sustainable, and you're going to put, put it on a lot of pressure to not being intermediated by someone else. So if you want to choose that selection, you, know, you need, really need to be very strong in what you do. Uh, but of course, also going to the left, going to the right, you know, owning more of the customer interface, you have to build a huge distribution network, you have to build a lot of you know, over, over the line you know, marketing to build your brand, etc. Uh, so that's also a very difficult game to, to play. Most insurance companies today are, are, are being found in this green bu bubble here. So they typically have 
a huge part of their distribution still by intermediaries. In this country, of course, broker channel or independent financial advisors having a very prominent role in South Africa, but most, most companies in, in South Africa have a combination of huge dependence on intermediaries, but at the same time, they also want to go direct uh, in the market. The difficulty now is that in the, the way the trends are happening right now, you have to be much more deliberate uh, uh, about your choices. And by the way, you can, also, you can actually also play in different parts, different quadrants of this matrix, uh, uh, man, many times through different, uh, different brands. And let, let's see how one of the really big companies out there do it. So if you take Allianz, you know, most of you, of course, know Allianz, of course, also present uh, in, in, in this market. They, interestingly, they play in many of these uh, quadrants, but with different, uh, with different strategies. So uh, if you go le bottom left, um, this is a lot of the, of, of the core of the Allianz uh, structure today, of course. Extremely good at, uh, at producing excellent, uh, excellent products, amazing underwriting skills, uh, very good in terms of uh, also on the claim, on the claim side. Uh, so extremely solid uh, in their base, and depending a lot on intermediaries to, to do the distribution for them. Also on the tied agent side, you know, in Europe, uh, to such an extent that uh, many of the tied agents won't, won't give any information back to, to, to Allianz, the mothership, because they're afraid that Allianz is going to somehow uh, you know, bypass them in the future. So. Uh, so you still have to do this, but, but of course, for, for actuaries like yourself, it's about you know, really, really understanding the product, really understanding the domain, really go deep in the specific domain to be the best producer of the product that you possibly get. So this is definitely a strategy that, uh, that, uh, that you can pursue. Of course, if you go to the right, <clears throat> you, could, you could have an ambition to go and own the customer. A lot of companies these days, they do this by launching a separate brand and very often a direct brand. Playing on the trends that we saw previously, they're saying that, listen, we can go direct to the market. We don't have to cannibalize our own business because we're going to have it under a different brand. Uh, so people won't even know that's underwritten by Allianz, but the All Secure is kind of the, the brand in the market. So of course, it's going to be written somewhere in the policy documents with very small font, you know, this is underwritten by Allianz. But it's definitely going to be positioned as a separate direct brand, not to, uh, to avoid channel conflicts with your intermediaries uh, specifically. It's also an interesting, an interesting play that you can, uh, that you can pursue. Uh, of course, for you as actuaries, this means something important. Uh, it means that you have to be very good at what we would call one-to-one -one type understanding of the customer, you know, because the trend is definitely to really, really understand. And going to the right here, you're going to get access to so much data on the customer, including getting access to third-party data. So the life of an actuary is going to be much more complicated if you want to go direct and really own the customer. Because the only way that you, know, you can really, really serve the customer in this good way is to really understand them and give them a very personalized, uh, personalized offer. And if you see the trends today in terms of how people are evolving as insurance companies, they start with this multi-channel, omni-channel kind of uh, ambition. We're going to be available for everyone through any channel. You can start offline, you can go online, you can call us in a call center, you can talk to an agent. We'll, anyone you talk to will know where you are, will know where you are on the journey. So we're investing a lot in the kind of omni-channel, uh, you know, single view of the customer, all those good things, core system migration, all those stuff that everyone is going, going through. Now, then, now and it, then it gradually evolves to, to something else. And the, second, the second wave is around really using data to derive insight uh, in, a more, in a more profound way. So we see people now hiring more data scientists than actu actuaries in many, many locations today because of access to data. And the third level, the third wave that we see is around um, deep personalization, one-to-one. -one. Uh, a simple example is Starbucks. You know, everybody has bought Starbucks uh, coffee, right? And uh, it's very interesting the way Starbucks have, have become the most personalized brand in the world. It only took them uh, six to seven months to go from 800 different emails that went out to 360,000 uh, personalized uh, emails that went out. And also the way they use data uh, in, their, in their coffee shops has been amazing. Uh, Starbucks actually could know, they could actually know if you landed on OR Tambo and if you would probably want an espresso rather than a cappuccino that you normally do. They would probably know that a girl or a boy that you, that you have met many times before in that Starbucks is in the Starbucks at the same time as you are. Uh, and they would probably, so, 
Actually, they know, actually, actually when we did, we did this in the US, and Starbucks actually told us to throttle down because people got very freaked out when there's total strangers said, and by the way, Anne, as you know, wink, wink, is there in the corner. Um, so they got totally freaked out. And stuff that shouldn't be public knowledge uh, was actually exposed in a very public way. So they know much more than that. But by doing that, they, become, they have become the most successful brand probably in the world on, on personalization. A third position is of going, going left. This is, this is um, you know, trying to build an ecosystem, uh, doing something else than you do today, but still being the producer to the ecosystem. Uh, just to continue on the Allianz example, this is um, the, the, rela the relationship to having BMW as an example. So if you buy a BMW in Germany today, it's going to be Allianz insurance embedded in that, in that vehicle. So you don't even have to buy a separate insurance anymore which of course has massive consequences, by the way, for, uh, for, for motor insurance in, in Germany. So when you, so when you push the, the distressed button in a BMW that you buy today, it's gonna go directly to the Allianz uh, call center, and an, an Allianz person is gonna say BMW road assistance, uh, not even branded Allianz. Uh, so you don't even have to buy insurance, it's already embedded in the product. They have pay-as-you-go telemetric kind of a capability to price it depending on your behavior. And when you contact the insurance company, you don't even know that you're contacting the insurance company, even though Allianz is, is underwriting the risk and handling the claim uh, at that point. Uh, so you are, of course, the, for the insurance company, is, sounds great, right? You get access to B&W distribution. Uh, you, need, you don't even have to pay for salespeople to do it. Uh, but of course, you all see the risk if Allianz tomorrow figures out that Allianz, you know, let's go to someone else. It's going to be a big problem for, for Allianz. But of course, if you're already embedded, if you already are embedded in the many, many thousands of, bo of, of um, repair shops, uh, and of course now Allianz is buying in a big way into repair shops network to, be, to create that relationship very, very sticky. So you can see that people are now uh, going outside of traditional insurance products to make themselves relevant, even though they don't own the, the, the customer interface per se. Again, you know, a super interesting position, uh, but, uh, but very difficult to pull off, and you're very reliant on having very good client relationships that you create stickiness around them. And for actuaries, of course, being able to price the risk at the best possible way, because uh, if, if you're not able to do that in a good way, the likelihood is that BMW is going to look for someone else to do their uh, risk and claims, and claims management uh, for them. Of course, for BMW, it's extremely important that claims management is done in a good way, because that's going to be said, given that they think it's BMW is doing it, so it's important that Allianz provides that in a very good way. So huge investments also on the, on the claims uh, side of this. Uh, so, this, this is, so you can see uh, Allianz, you know, a big global player, how they're positioning themselves differently, different brands, different capabilities, different skills, different access to data, huge, huge consequences for actuaries in terms of understanding this development. And then, of course, there's one more position, which is upper right-hand corner. I'm actually going to deep dive a little bit on that, which is more around, can you envision a world where you, as an insurer, uh, actually try to both own the customer and launch something else in addition to insurance. And the notion being that if we can own the customer interface, if, we, if they can associate us as the brand, not only on insurance, which is for many, as I said, is a grudge, grudge purchase, but on other stuff that's really important to them, that might be something where we can create a lot of value. And of course, we often look to China here, because not, not because China is you know, great, but because of China, you know, of course in China, given the the governance system that they have over there, they go much further in terms of allowing data to be shared uh, than you do because of the legislation in, in, in Western Europe in particular. Uh, so we often look to China to see if you had access to data, what will the world look like? Not to say that it's going to be copied in, in here or in Western Europe or in the, or in the States, because, because regulation is going to forbid that, but at least we get to see a little bit of what the future could like, look like if you were allowed to have a communist state giving you all the data, basically. So um, this is uh, um, uh, something very, I'm going to deep dive a little bit in, in two seconds around that. So, so this is basically what we see today. Um, this, this positioning today where insurance companies are not, you know, they are a little bit, you know, no, we need, we need the brokers, you know, we're dependent on them at the same time. We want to go direct into the market. And by the way, if someone wants to white label us, you know, we can produce for you as well. Uh, but, you know, 
that, 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 that world is very quickly eroding. You have to have a much more deliberate positioning, much more firm stance on where you want to play and understand how you're going to win when you play these games. Uh, than before, but of course, as you saw earlier, you can play in different parts of the of the world. So, let's do a small experiment experiment right now. I'm going to ask you two questions. The first one is around: if you think about your the company you represent today, it could be a primary insurer, it could be a reinsurer, it could be a broker, whatever. But if you think of a classical, you know, your company today, where in this quadrant uh, are you actually playing? So, if you go back to your Slido for the 600 people in the room who, who did it. Try to figure out, and, if you, and if, uh, if you look at the slide, or you're going to be asked, you know, which of those quadrants. Of course, your company is probably playing in many of the quadrants, but if you think primarily, where do you play today? Ah, interesting. This is interesting. <laughs> so you only have 31% to set that you're on the upper left or upper side in terms of being an ecosystem provider. Most of you say that you're still a back-end operator and a manufacturer of products. Of course, you have brokers and stuff, but you're not actually owning the customer interface. And 26% uh, uh, is saying that you're, you are, you know, you're, yes, you are selling classical insurance products, but you are uh, trying to go to the right and trying to own the customer interface as well. Uh, so, but still, interestingly enough, uh, a huge proportion still in the classical insurance space. I'm going to ask you the same question in two seconds from now, but then trying to predict in the future, given the trends that you see, do you think that that's going to, uh, that's going to change or not? But let's look at that upper right-hand corner for two seconds, Ping An as an example. What are they actually doing, and why is it interesting for them to play upper right-hand side? They have become uh, what we call an ecosystem or orchestrator. So if you look at the, the five areas that they play in, and it's, it's quite interesting to see how they, play, how they play the game and how aggressive they play the game. Oh, no, they, they, are, they definitely they have a banking license. They provide banking services, although they are an insurance company. You know, not, not a small banking service, you know, 69 million customers. Small player you know, in China, but you know, it's quite significant uh, uh, if you look at any other company. I think the healthcare ecosystem is extremely interesting. Uh, they, have, uh, they have developed the largest network of general practitioners in China. So not only do they provide health insurance, but they actually own the actual network who employs thousands and thousands of GPs in, in China. And as you can see, as many as 450,000 daily consultations go through their own network. They also own insurance uh, hospitals, uh, etc. So they are not only investing in the health space, but also investing in all the periphery products. Uh, my favorite product maybe is the, on the right-hand side, they're being a big, big player in, in smart city. Uh, so not so providing the infrastructure, you know, and connected everything through Internet of Things, they're connecting everything, security services, etc. So you can just imagine what that could do for an insurance player if you really own the smart city play uh, going forward. So uh, I think this is uh, 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 a super interesting case. Maybe as a different uh, digression maybe, it's also the way they do recruiting of talent. So in Ping An, there are no people working anymore with recruiting of talent. Everything is being done digitally. And the chat posts that are talking to the potential recruits, uh, you, there's no way you can almost tell the difference if you're actually talking to a human or if you're talking to uh, a machine. Uh, they're hiring 50,000 agents uh, every month, uh, so there's no way you can build up an HR, HR company to do that. So they have to do it uh, digitally, just to give you a, size, a sense of the magnitude. All the interviews are being done digitally. They scan uh, the CVs to figure out this is a, this is a successful agent, and they scan, they scan the CV and try to figure out by AI, you know, is this likely or not likely to be a good agent? They look at um, body language, twitches in your face, all kinds of stuff to understand uh, are you likely to be a good agent or not? Everything being done digitally. And as I said, hiring 600,000 agents uh, a year, uh, everything digital through. So give a sense of where we are going to. So China, I think China is an interesting example. If you get like, access to data, and of course, Ping An, very scrupulously uses data across all the different ventures. Uh, so the thing they learn about people on the left-hand side as the health pe uh, person they, they use on the, in the real estate system. So for example, if you are a person who needs a wheelchair and, and, can't, and you need a specific uh, 
house to be able to live a, a good life, that, that information is being carried over to the guys working on the real estate side, just to give an extent to how scrupulously they, they exchange data. Of course, this would not be allowed uh, in, um, and maybe uh, we're happy to say that's not allowed today, but at the same time, it shows a little bit of the potential of big data analytics when you can really cross-fertilize uh, uh, across it. So, just to give you a sense of the upper right-hand corner of positioning, so the insurance companies are, there are also some insurance companies who are fighting that game, uh, and of course, you know, in South Africa, we also see players, uh, you, know, you know, of course, Discovery and the Vitality Program is maybe an obvious one, but we also see many other uh, companies these days vying for this ecosystem, ecosystem play. But again, huge investments uh, needed, very difficult to, to pull off, you need to have stamina, but again, for you guys in the room, huge implications. You're going to have access to much more data, uh, uh, you're going to be assisted by really, really deep computing. Uh, you're going to be working much more across with other people in the organization, you'll be working agile in multidisciplinary teams rather than in your own department. Uh, so huge changes for you as, uh, as actuaries if you want to be in, in, the, in the ecosystem play. But I think, more fun, I think more fun as well to become an actuary of the future. Not only do you need to be much more, uh, give, uh, have more access to much more tools and resources in, on the computing and the more financial part of it, but also you need to be much more understanding of customer uh, preferences and customer trends to really be able to price risk in a, and understand risk in a good way, in a much more different way than, than before. So going back to the question, so uh, we saw earlier that, uh, that you know, 43%, uh, I think, was, was still an back, back operator, but if you look in the future, 10 years from now, where do you think, do you still think your company is going to be you know, where they were, or do you think they're going to be playing a different game? Ah, wow, okay, super interesting. I'm, I'm gonna use this, you know, cynically when I'm talking to clients, you know. 1,500 of the brightest people in South Africa told, and actuaries told me that, that you, you, they're gonna go from being a producer to an ecosystem orchestrator. So as you can see, you know, 65% uh, think you're gonna play an ecosystem play. I think it's interesting, I think it's, I think it's cool, I think it's, uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's courageous and bold uh, that you want to have that ambition, but, but I have to say it's extremely difficult to, to pull off, and you're going to be competing against the telecom players, the big tech players, the big banks, you know, everyone and their mother is going to be thinking about you know, owning the customer, so it is, uh, it's a beautiful proposition if you can pull it off. It's, it's very, very difficult. It's going to create a lot of money, a lot of talent. Uh, but for you guys in the room, it's a much more, I think, enjoyable experience. Although, also being very good in your domain is, of course, also, I think, quite interesting. So to try to summarize uh, a little bit of what we, what we said, so here are some of the, the, the takeaways. Insurance is definitely going to be uh, uh, disrupted. Traditional profit pools are going to be eroded. Digital is going to be your friend, but can also be your, your enemy. It's uh, very much around capabilities. You know, what we say is, is you know, it's... 20, 30 percent is about the tools, analytics, AI, big data, but 70 percent is still a, is going to be around good human judgment. Uh, so we don't believe that the future of actuaries is going to be um, uh, a negative one. On the contrary, we think it's a, it's a beautiful uh, horizon for the actuaries who are willing to take that uh, that step. It's going to be a beautiful thing, uh, but it, but it actually means that you need to reskill yourself, think about this future. Uh, it's, it's going to be a data thing, but it's also going to be a very human thing. So uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, there are a lot of things happening. Insurance companies are going to position themselves a little bit differently. The future is bright for all of you, but you need to invest in yourself, both in terms of under really understanding what you can do with data science and the tools that you're getting, but also really understanding the customer journeys and how that's going to play out. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention, everyone. Is it likely that in the future there will be no be traditional insurance companies, but rather technical officials? Yes, we don't think so. We don't think so. Uh, and if you look at the PNL of big tech, uh, and if you look at you know guys like Google, even Apple, you know, those even Amazon, uh, they're all venturing into financial services. That is correct. And you can also, particularly in payments and stuff like that. But you know everyone has an ambition to do something in financial services, including insurance. 
But if you look at the actual contribution to the total PNL, it typically is between 0.2% and 0.5%. So even if they become a major player, it's still going to be a very, very small part of the PNL. The only reason why they play the game, for example, for Apple, is because you want to be able to sell hardware device because you own the customer interface, you create a sticky interface. If they're, not in the, they're not in it to make money on financial services, they're in it to create stickiness around their core products, which they make tons of money on, much more money they can do in this space. And that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, they don't have what you have, <laughs> that, that, what you in the room have. Uh, they actually lack um, deep, deep, uh, understanding of how risk works and deep, deep understanding of how to price it. Yes, they can do proxies. Yes, they can do easy stuff. Yes, they can use algos to do some easy stuff. But really, when it comes down to it, you know, the actual work that you guys are doing, the human, the human judgment that you must apply, it's still very, we're still very, very far off for that being uh, disintermediated by, by technology. Uh, so for, on one hand side, we think that, you know, yes, they will be active, but it's much more going to be as a, as a complement to doing something else that they make more money on. And secondly, it's very difficult for them because guys in the room like yourself have something that you just can't, that the machine can't do yet. Um, which, as I said before, there, you see, but you still have to develop because, you know, machines will quickly get the hang of it, but, but there's always going to be a room for, for, for actuaries that can really understand and price risk, and that's probably difficult uh, for, for these guys. Uh, where are the opportunities about the insurance in the four archetypes given lower income penetration in China versus being not quite having any uh, IoT types? Yeah, I th we, we still think that you know, for, for South African insurance companies, you can still play in all of those uh, quadrants. Interestingly, we do feel that there are uh, that actually there are many of those ecosystem plays, for example, that are very uh, that's still wide space. For example, we, we strongly believe in this uh, smart city concept. Uh, and uh, if you look at all the problems you were having in inner city problems, just look at you know CBD in, in Joburg, just look at the, the horrible traffic situation, the climate, you know, things that we have, the lack of security that we have in, 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 in cities, uh, in, even in South Africa. Uh, we think there's a lot of things you can do there. There's a lot of risk events happening in, in those uh, cities that you can do something about, just as an example. So, and I think you know, insurance companies are well positioned to, take, to become maybe a driver of those ecosystems. Uh, but you have to be quick because you know, all the guys out there, you know, the banks, the MTNs of the world are also thinking the same game. But still, I think actually that, um, that uh, there's still a lot of room for it. I wouldn't worry too much about, you know, online or internet penetration and internet of things, that, that, that is you know, coming very rapidly, also in the low, also in the low LSM part of, uh, of South Africa. Uh, so we still believe that there's a lot of white space and you can play in all four quadrants effectively also in South Africa. Maybe, maybe one last one, that we I'm looking at the time, maybe one last one. Do you believe there's still a future for a back? Uh, how do we, okay. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. On this one, it's not an easy question. I think you probably are much better than me to, to, to answer that question. But I do think that given the computing power and the importance of data science today, there's definitely going to be a, a hardcore analytical quantitative side of it. But I think all of you guys in the room, you are so smart that that's something you, you can, or you know, the new generation also will, will get. I think I'll be much more focused on the, on the more softer part of the game, where actuaries really need to understand the customer journeys, customer pain points, what are the risk events, and really more, more on the softer side of things. And uh, uh, so, so I think the actual of the future is kind of a little bit de-averaged. You know, being average on the quant side on, or on the soft interpersonal side, it's not going to cut it anymore. You have to, be, you, have to be, you have to actually understand both sides of that spectrum. The super actuary is, of course, the guy the, or the, the, girl, the woman or the man who can do both things. That's kind of the super actuary. At the same time, there will be room for spikes either on the left-hand side, really hardcore quants, or on the right-hand side, having okay actuarial skills, but being extremely good at the soft side and the partnership side, because there's going to be so much third-party data for us next time you're going to, you're going to work on as well. So I, I think um, being able to allow for differences in profiles and actuaries and actually harness them, but, but also telling them that mediocrity is not going to cut it. You, have to, you really have to specialize, but there's this hard, hardcore side of it, and there's a softer side of it, and that, that's what you need to train for going forward. 
Okay, I think time is up. Thank you for your attention. I know it was quick, but thank you very much. And I see you at uh, Katsis with some wicked dance moves uh, later on tonight. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.